Welcome. Thank you for attending our webinar on the ethylene oxide clinical bachelor's today. My name is Courtney Lane. And I work in the anthropologization section. We'll start today just kind of giving a brief overview of the ethylene oxide sterilization, how it works, and the uh, summer validation. This slide kind of gives you a brief overview of the scientific aspects of ethylene oxide. Um, it is a widely used low temperature sterilant. Um, it is Like a stock, I'm so Welcome. Thank you for joining us today on the webinar for the Ethylene Oxide Clinical Batch Release. My name is Courtney Lane. I'm the Study Director in the EO Sterilization Department. We're going to start today by just giving a brief or er, quick inter overview of the ethylene oxide sterilization. Ethylene oxide sterilization is a commonly used low temperature um, sterilization process. It uses um, obviously the ethylene oxide gas, which is a colorless, odorless gas. Um, there are, it is a known carcinogen and mutagen, so very, um, so you take extra precautions when using the sterilant. Um, these are just some scientific facts about you about the molecule and just um, gives you a brief, quick overview of the, of the molecule itself. The properties of EO, the strange bonds that are what makes the, the molecule very reactive. The mode of steriliz sterilization is that it disrupts the nucleic acids in the microorganisms, um, which is killing them off, which is how this process works. There are four critical parameters for EO sterilization that contribute to the lethality of the process. Those are temperature, relative humidity, time, and gas concentration. We'll go over each one of these and kind of talk about how they, how they affect the sterilization. Temperature. Temperature has what we call a Q10 effect. Um, for every 10 degrees that you increase the temperature, you approximately double the inactivation rate of the organisms on the device. Um, typical cycles are between 46 and 55 degrees Celsius. And uh, we, can we can sterilize at lower temperatures. This generally is going to increase your, your, your uh, EO blow times and uh, make for a, for a little longer of a cycle. Relative humidity is needed for sterilization for the alkylation process. Um, the optimal humidity level is about 30 to 35 percent. Um, anything in excess of that is going to increase the rate of sterilization and increase that alkylation reaction. Gas concentration is another variable. Common values for gas concentration are 400 to 600 milligrams per liter. Um, as expected, as you increase the concentration of ethylene oxide, you will also increase the lethality rate um, of the process. It's also important to remember that your gas concentration is going to, you know, affect your residual levels. So take note when determining your gas concentration for your cycle. Exposure time. Um, and that, uh, contract sterilization facilities typically will cap that time at about 12 hours. So typical ranges are about 2 to 10 hours of ethylene oxide dwell time, um, which is in excess of the conditioning time. Um, the exposure time really isn't the time it takes for the ethylene oxide to kill the organism, but it's the time it takes for the ethylene oxide to get into the product and get to the locations where the organisms are, are hiding. So it's not how long it takes to kill it, it's how long it takes to, to get there. There are four phases of the sterilization process. The preconditioning phase, which is typically
basically held it in a different reconditioning room. And this time could be anything from 12 hours of preconditioning to, to 24 hours of preconditioning. And after the preconditioning phase, it's moved into the sterilizer. At that point, you will, you will get your conditioning and exposure phases, and then it will be removed and placed into aeration. The heated aeration portion is important for the gas well, or the, I'm sorry, the, uh, the degassing of the product for residual purposes. And this graph kind of just shows a little bit of how that process works in chamber. For the validation process, we will typically do cycle development testing, and that is going to um, we will evaluate the device as well as um, process challenge devices to use for the validation process. That is then followed by your half and full cycles at the sterilization facility, um, all the ancillary testing and the review and final report process. This, test, this process can take anywhere from four to five months. So now we have our problem. The whole validation costs, costs money and costs a lot of time. It also requires a lot of devices that we may not always have time. So that sometimes is a problem for a lot of startup companies or just companies that need to do some clinical trials that need to sell a sterile product. So what's the solution to your problem? The answer is to perform a clinical batch release. A clinical batch release is the standalone process in which you cannot change the whole product. Um, you do not need to go through a full validation. And you know, failing one batch does not call into question the last batch. Since it is a standalone process, there's required testing for each and every batch that should be completed. There is guidance found in the Amy TIR 16 document that states um, what is what needs to be proven for a clinical batch release. A clinical batch release can be performed with more than just EO sterilization. It can also be uh, used for steam, dry heat, BHP irradiation. Um, there may be slightly different test requirements than what we'll go over in the following presentation, but uh, it can be accomplished using those levels of sterilization as well. So the AME TIR 16 document states that um, for small volume production that um, you can release product based on a specific test criteria. Um, essentially what we're going to do is uh, we will run, there are three phases to a batch release. There are three sterilization, which is going to be bioburden testing, product inoculation, um, or PCD preparation, if you've gotten to that point, um, followed by a half cycle, which will include all the clinical units and all the following test units as well. And then those units will be removed from the load, and the full cycle will be tested with the following set point, or with the following testing to follow. Um, The batch release is conducted using the overkill method, which, which means that during the half cycle, you need to be able to kill a six log um, a VI with a population of 10 to the 6. And what that proves is that during the, full, or during the full cycle, you will essentially be able to double that, double that, that sterility assurance level and give you the 10 to the to the minus six assurance level that is required for a sterility claim. So for a batch release, the low considerations are a little less than for validation. The only real thing that we need to know is the total product volume. That product, total product volume is going to dictate how many BIs need to monitor each load. Um, typically, for a one cubic meter load, we will use five BIs or inoculated devices to monitor the half cycle and three
three CIs to monitor the full cycle. So there is a lot of required testing, um, and we'll kind of go over that now and when that testing is to take place. Prior to the half cycle, we will run bioborne enumeration. And what that testing is going to do is going to classify and uh, give us numbers for the bioburden that's present on the device prior to sterilization. This information is important to um, make sure that we have a cycle adequate to kill that natural bioburden during the half cycle. We recommend for this testing that you test for all four organism types, uh, being aerobic, anaerobic, fungal, and spores. Um, and the sample size for this testing is 3 to 10 samples, depending on your lot size. Following the bioburden testing, we will then take the eight devices for a one cubic meter load, and we will uh, evaluate the devices and look for the hardest to kill location. The TIR39 provides guidance on what type of inoculation locations to look for. Those include um, small lumens, mated surfaces, um, anything that's going to present a challenge for EO to get into. Um, we will then inoculate the devices in as many locations as, as needed. So for example, some devices may have you know, three to four inoculation locations for a, you know, a somewhat complex device or you know, just one depending on how, how difficult the product is to sterilize. Um, there are three different mo um, methods of inoculation. We can inoculate using a commercially prepared BI, which is our, um, you know, is the, um, is the method in which we like to use most the commercially prepared BIs do add um, very consistent results. Um, sometimes, for example, in tight lumens, it's a little bit difficult to get a BI in there. So we will use an inoculated carrier. We will inoculate a wire or a suture, and we will feed that into the, into the device to make sure that you represent those, those locations. Um, in the event that we cannot use a BI or inoculated carrier, we can directly inoculate the device using a spore suspension. Um, this is a destructive manner in which to test because we will have to immerse the product for BI sterility testing in the event that we, that we inoculate using this method. Also, before we get started, we want to do a population verification on either the commercially prepared BI or the sutures themselves or uh, the inoculated devices if necessary. What this is going to do is verify the viability of the spores as well as give us a, a population to help determine the value later. The sample size for this testing is we will need three BIs for USP and four BIs for ISO compliance. There is specific um, acceptance criteria for the BIs, specifically for the um, commercially prepared BIs, in that USP requires that the log difference should be no less than 0.3 or more, no more than 0.4 log difference than the labeled population. The ISO requires that the population be within less than 50% or greater than 300% the labeled population. These requirements, um, when the math has been applied, are pretty equivalent. Um, so typically, if you are within you know, one, you, you'll have the other one as well. Following the full cycle is when we would turn, the, I'm sorry, the half cycle is when we would do the product sterility testing. This testing is confirmation testing and does not does not go towards you know claiming your devices are sterile, but just confirms that during the half cycle, the amount of dwell time and concentration and temperature 
exceeded the necessary requirements for the natural vital burden among the products. For this testing, we recommend 10 devices for the product sterility and 6 devices for bacteriostasis fungospaces testing. The bacteriostasis fungospaces testing, or BF testing, is a necessary test to validate the product sterility. A small video clip on product sterility testing and how it is performed. Um, essentially, all we're going to do is in the clean room, we will um, unpackage the device and it will be dropped into one of two medias a soy media and also a bio media for, um, to accommodate both aerobic and anaerobic growth. The the uh, jar of the media containing the device will be placed in an incubator and incubated for a minimum of 14 days. Uh, the BI sterility testing, this is kind of a good example of that testing as well, which we'll get into, kind of just shows how it performed being dropped into the media. Um, following, the, following these results, for following the testing, we'll score the jars for growth. You can see from the slides, you know, kind of what a positive would look like for each media type. And we're looking for a cell here. So um, what we need to accomplish for a batch release is complete kill on the half cycle. So any growth in the media is going to have direct results on the, on the batch release itself, and we'll kind of stop it dead in the water. So, um, we definitely need no growth here. After we get these, the same samples will be transferred for bacteriostasis fungistasis testing. And what we will do is we'll inoculate each test, each test vial with um, the specific test organisms listed here. And what we will do is these need to demonstrate growth. And what this test improves is that there is nothing in the device that will inhibit the growth of organisms and give us a false negative result on our product sterility testing. This series of testing, the BF testing, is only required one time on the device unless there has been any manufacturing or product changes. Um, that data is to support product sterility. Um, following both the half and the full cycle, we will need to test the BI sterility. So however, the devices were inoculated, so they will be tested accordingly. And what this testing is going to determine is it's going to help us to prove that we reached the correct sterility assurance level as needed for sterility claims. And it's, kind of, it's, it's essentially the same method as product sterility. However, we will just remove the BI, um, whether it be a BI strip, a inoculated carrier or uh, for the device itself and we'll submerge it in our in our media and that media will need to incubate for seven days. And again here we're looking for growth, no growth results. Um, and you know we want the we want the BIs to die in the half cycle just to help demonstrate that twelve that twelve log or log production. Following the full cycle, then we'll test the samples for EO residual. Um, these, these samples will have been exposed to a half and full cycle. And what the testing does is determine the amount of ethylene oxide residual found on the device following sterilization. The ISO 10993-7 does state specific levels that these residuals need to be under for um, to pass this test. We recommend three samples for this for this line of testing. And um, essentially what we'll do for this testing is the devices will be immersed in a, an extraction fluid and extracted for an appropriate amount of time. The amount of time will vary based on the device. There are three product categories. Um, those product categories are limited exposure, prolonged exposure, and permanent. Limited exposure is going to be any device that is used 
for less than 24 hours. And this would be anything that is used multiple times um, by the same patient or, or just once, that it cannot exceed cumulatively more than 24 hours. Um, prolonged exposure is going to be any device that is um, used for longer than 24 hours but not 30 days. And then finally, permanent use of a contact is going to be something that's impossible or something that's going to have patient contact that exceeds 30 days. There are specific EO residual levels that can be on the device, which is dependent upon which type of device it is. Uh, for a limited use device, the average, the most you can have on the device is 4 milligrams. And that is going to be determined on a worst case situation for how long the device will be in contact with the patient. Typically, we recommend for limited use devices that they are tested for three times the expected patient contact time, and that is to kind of simulate a worst case situation with that device. For EO, it's going to be four milligrams that are allowed on that device, and for ECH, nine milligrams. Um, we also do test for ethylene glycol. But the standard does not have any set standard or set limits for that. Um, for prolonged, prolonged and permanent use, these devices are exhaustively extracted. And they will be extracted until there is a 10% decrease from the initial um, extraction or um, until it's significantly irrelevant. Um, it's the same type of level for the first 24 hours for both you're looking at 4 milligrams. Your average daily dose um, does decrease a little bit for um, ECH to 2.4 per day. Um, so it's just take special note of how the device is classified when determining your what levels are acceptable. required for testing is LAL testing. And this is required for devices that um, have any sort of blood or cerebral spinal fluid contact. Um, any devices that also carry with it a pyrogen-free claim or are also subjected to this testing. Um, again, there are acceptable levels established. Um, for any device that contacts the blood, it's a, uh, it is acceptable to have less than 20 EU per device. Um, for any devices that contact is cerebral spinal fluid, you are looking at requirements to be under 2.15 EU per device. We recommend for this testing that 3% of the lot be tested. Um, and uh, there needs to be a 3% minimum with a 10% maximum. That FDA guidance document has been withdrawn, but on a conservative measure, we do just recommend the 3% of the lot. So for the EOs, the amount of samples that you will need, um, for the, the total test units down there is the 27, and that's the minimum that's going to be for a one cubic meter loaf or less. We'll need the three samples for BioBurden, Eight samples for product inoculation, ten samples for product sterility, six for BF, three for LAL, and three for residuals. The six samples for BF um, can be can can come out of the ten samples for product sterility. And we actually do recommend that because then the samples be you know the same the testing process for both product sterility and BF. Um, just easily validating that test. So in order to claim sterility on the devices following the testing, we need to prove a sterility assurance level of 10 to the minus 6. Um, we do that by calculating a z-value um, for, for the cycle and a sterility assurance level, or ster ster for law reduction. For law reduction is calculated by the following equation. Um, and you can see it there. 
In this example, we're using initial population provided by the population verification testing of 2.0 times 10 to the 6 CSE per BI. Um, for this example, we used a total of 20 BIs, and based on the uh, CS sterility testing, nine of those, or 19 of those were negative. And we have to assume one positive for calculation purposes, which you can see there in the result. We that yields a greater than value. Um, so for the half cycle, or for the half cycle, we got a seven, a seven uh, SLR greater than. So for the full cycle, we would double that number. So the SLR then a fifteen point three for the full cycle, and then if we add the two together, we we are about a twenty three watt reduction for the half and full cycle. This is well in excess of the 12 um, law reduction required for sterilized devices. So there is a large safety factor built in for the batch release process. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, again, my name is Courtney Lang. I've included some other members of our validation team, um, David Gilbert and Derek Peterson. We are all able to assist and happy to assist you if you have any questions. Um, and we look forward to working with you soon. Have a wonderful day.